Alegría. Planet Radio Live for December 5th, 2012 with my guest Paul Andrew Mitchell. We're going to pick it up here where we left off in part one. Again, we're splitting the files on this show because of the length of the show. Almost three hours went live and uh, we wanted to make it as easy as possible for everybody to download. So we'll continue here with the conversation. So we don't have an attorney general at the moment. And I'm thinking in a couple of key cases that I'm investigating at the moment, I may actually commandeer that office for purposes of the paperwork. Okay. Now I'm not going to, you know, show up and try to oust Eric from his office. He's got a lot of people <laughs> working for well, him there, right? Okay. So this goes right to the heart of something I wanted to ask you. And I know you've explained it before, but for the sake of this audience, you're acting in the capacity as private attorney general. I don't think many people understand that. The first time I, I'll be honest with you, the first time I saw that, I went, what is that? That's bullshit. And then I began to dig through your site, and I'm like, okay, this is pretty legitimate. Whoever this guy is, he's serious. So how is it, by what virtue do you have the title of private attorney general, Paul? Well, number one, the racketeering laws have a civil remedy at Section 1964. And the purpose of that was explained in the legislative intent. Congress basically said, we don't have public prosecutors who are trained and experienced in busting rackets. So (laughs) we're opening up an opportunity. Yeah, they just basically (laughs) said, U.S. attorneys and county prosecutors and state you know, attorneys general, they don't have experience busting rackets, so they don't bother. <laughs> they leave the rackets alone. But racketeering had become a really serious problem nationwide, and Congress decided to do something about it, so they enlisted private citizens. They said, we want your help in enforcing this law, and, and this is what you can do for us. If you step into this role properly, we'll award you triple damages off the top. It's automatic if you prevail. And so they they threw in something that didn't even show up in the U.S. Code. They said, we are allowing these statutes to be liberally construed to effect their legislative intent. So the private citizen has two things going for him or her, assuming they're willing and able to step into that role and, you know, and follow the procedures that are laid out. They can exercise the authority of an attorney general in limited situations, and they have this extra benefit of being able to apply a liberal construction rule to these statutes as opposed to a strict construction rule. And furthermore, Congress said it only takes two RICO predicate acts to constitute a pattern of racketeering. So if somebody commits mail fraud twice, that's racketeering. The definition of racketeering is liberal in and of itself. It only takes two during any given 10-year period. So the way a private citizen does this is that he goes in, he or she, I don't mean to be gender uh, specific here, I'm just going to say he, okay? Um, He goes into court representing the United States or the state of California or the people of the United States of America, ex-rel. Now that's a Latin abbreviation that means ex-relacione, out of the person's or the citizen's relationship to this entity, he can move the court. He can file a criminal complaint. He can commence a civil RICO action, you see. And doing it properly in the paperwork designates that person as a private attorney general. And now when the Supreme Court was asked to rule on the constitutionality and you know enforcement of this law, they said, here's the intent, we agree with it, and the intent was always to allow private citizens to become private attorneys general, not only to investigate rackets diligently, 
you know, to do a good job investigating, but also to prosecute them. Now, the word prosecute has a very important legal meaning. The Supreme Court has said you can prosecute a racket as a private attorney general if you know what you're doing. Of course, you know, you have to follow rules of evidence and rules of procedure. You just can't walk into a court and, you know, start, you know, throwing bowling balls in everyone's mm -hmm. direction. You've you got to follow procedure, motions and, you know, service of process and so on and so forth. But if you do it right, and I've done it numerous times, okay, you become a private attorney general. And you have the concurrence of the Congress of the United States and the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, the executive branch in the federal government doesn't like this, but it's because of their negligence that Congress enacted this law in the first place. It's because of people like Eric Holder that we have to step in and do the job he's not doing. Okay? So I eventually charged all 200,000 members of the State Bar of California for not having valid licenses, and I had to do something because they were all involved in a felony racket. And I had to report it properly. It wasn't just mail fraud. I mean, it's false imprisonment, you know, <coughs> it's extortion, witness retaliation, obstruction of justice. <coughs> Pardon me. There's a long rap sheet in Section 1961. So I encourage you to look at that statute because uh, there are a, an awful lot of crimes that Congress has identified as RICO predicate acts. And as I said, it only takes two of those in any given 10-year period to constitute a pattern of racketeering activities. So I'm glad you followed through because a lot of people react the same way. They go, oh, you're making this up. You know, you're full of BS. And then when they look further into it the way you did, they realize, no, wait a minute. The, the Congress wants private citizens to do this, and the Supreme Court has approved it, you know, without qualification. So I think that's probably why the marshals never really caused any serious problems for me. Once they figured out that I knew what I was doing, they just leave me alone. Do you find that the U.S. marshals tend to be allies? It seems to me like maybe them and up until recently the Secret Service seemed above the fray in terms of the intrigues that seem to plague uh, quasi-government activities. Well, frankly, uh, I reached the limit of these to Marshall's knowledge pretty quickly because they don't spend their day reading law. They spend their day maintaining security in the courthouse and, you know, shuttling criminals to and from detention to courtrooms and this kind of thing, you know what I mean? And then they, you know, they, they do arrest people and they do that kind of investigative work, but they don't spend hours and hours out of every week reading federal law and they don't bother getting involved in litigation. I mean, the job that they have to do may, you know, focus for many hours any given week on, you know, making sure that some witness is being protected or making sure that some person who's been arrested is, uh, you know, not going to be shot because he's turned state's evidence. And then there's the whole, you know, enforcement side of the U.S. Marshals where they really are police and they really are going out, you know, investigating crimes and arresting people and confiscating Contraband. Thank you so for that. That was, that was my follow-up question. Are they enforcement officers? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. If you need to report a felony, you can go to the marshals, and that will satisfy your legal obligation, provided that it's, you know, a federal offense. They may refer you to a sheriff, but it's good to make friends with the, sh with the marshals because they can, they can be your worst enemy or they can be your best friend. So it's good to show respect for the office, if nothing else, because they do have a lot of authority. You, in, in terming them as law enforcement, I was kind of going in a, a maybe a tangent. We have a problem in this country with what I will simply call brainwashing of public servants. Um, police officers clearly don't know the law. They can't differentiate between a statute and an actu actual law. And it's an important distinction. I know you've made this distinction before that statutes apply within the municipality, which takes us back to uh, the federal zone again. Am I correct in stating that? Um, in other words, what are statutes? Because even the tax code itself is predicated on, on, on statutes. Okay, the word statute has come to mean lots of different things. And when you're talking to me, uh, I restrict the meaning of that to the statutes at large. 
The statutes at large are the very first place where acts of Congress are published, and they are published in chronological order. Then, if they fit somewhere into the U.S. Code, let's say it was a modification or an amendment to the copyright law, that amendment will get codified into Title 17, which is a matrix, as you know. It's just hmm. 50 columns mm -hmm. in the rows or sections. But the U.S. Code is not the original Acts of Congress. If there's some difference, for example, I, you may have noticed that I said the liberal construction rule was never codified. Right. In the RICO laws that showed up in the statutes at large, you will find that liberal construction rule because that is the law back there. It just doesn't show up in the U.S. Code because it was never codified. Now, some people have come to redefine the word statute to mean something I don't entirely agree with. They're trying to say, well, statute law is not real law, it's not constitutional law, it's not organic law. I, I don't exactly know what point they're trying to make here, but I get the feeling that people who have come to adopt this other weird definition have been misled, and the purpose of that uh, misleading is to steer people away from the statutes at large. You see my point? Yeah, I do, and actually, uh, I, this is where I wanted to get you in the conversation on this. I want you to make that distinction. Yeah, well, statutes at large are where Congress uh, publishes the official version of all their acts and resolutions and private acts. Everything goes in there. Treaties. If it's not in there, it doesn't exist. That's how important the statutes at large are. Okay? If, if it doesn't show up in there, it isn't a law. You can ignore it. Now, that's not to say anything about regulations, because that's executive side, that's executive branch, but when it comes to the Congress of the United States, you know, the federal legislature, that's the official publication of all acts of Congress. Okay, so I'm not really sure what some of these other activists are talking about when they criticize statute law, because I don't, I don't think they've ever read the statute so large. If they had, they, they, know, they would know that they're making a very serious error in their various teachings. I got into this one time with a guy who was trying to tell me that statutes aren't law, and it only took me five minutes to show him that his whole argument was worthless, and it wasn't going to get him very far in any kind of in federal litigation. And he finally realized, you know, the, the error of his ways, and he stopped talking like that, but he had habituated himself to, you know, make this argument to everyone who was willing to listen. I said to him, you've got to be careful, you know, because the Bible has a very, very serious punishment for false teachers. Mm -hmm. And, that, you know, he was really shocked by that. And I said, you're, you're not teaching the truth. You're teaching a falsehood when you make this silly argument. Um, the distinction that needs to be made is that Congress wears two different hats. Sometimes a statute will apply to people inside the states of the Union, and at other times a statute will apply only to federal citizens and resident aliens. Let me give you two really simple examples that are commonplace. The Freedom of Information Act was enacted and provided a remedy to people throughout the states of the Union and all federal territories and possessions to you know, obtain copies of federal documents. There's no restriction. If the document exists, the requester has a right to it. The requester doesn't have to say, oh, I'm a resident alien or I'm a federal citizen or I'm not. If the document exists, the requester has a right to it. You see how clear that intent is? Mm -hmm. Now, contrast that with the Privacy Act. In the Privacy Act, the Federal Privacy Act, it says individual means citizen of the United States and resident of the United States, just like subtitle A of the Internal Revenue Code. So if you're going to invoke the Federal Privacy Act in federal court, you better be an individual as defined in the law, because that law is federal municipal law. Do you see the difference? Yes, yes. In so fact, you hear the key term there with individual. Isn't that even in itself kind of a, a, a tag put onto this? Sure. Well, it's the same individual as the word individual on Form 1040. Right. It's right. the U.S. individual, right. And that's also a statute, but it's federal municipal law, okay? So if you're going to be invoking the Federal Privacy Act in federal court, 
you're basically telling the federal court that you're one of those individuals. They may not bother inquiring, you know, if you know what you're doing. They'll just assume that you know what you're doing and that you're an individual as defined in the law. But that law is federal municipal law. Now, another similar uh, pair is Title 42, United States Code, Sections 1983 and 1985. 1983 is a remedy for civil conspiracies, okay? Mm -hmm. But the courts have ruled that that's federal municipal law because it's a codification of the 1866 Civil Rights Act. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We've just gone full circle. Yeah. Now, 1985 is not federal municipal law, and here's why. The Ninth Circuit has said 1985 in Title 42 is a law that implements the 13th Amendment banning slavery and involuntary servitude. Well, that's federal national law as we now know. And the Ninth Circuit in Gillespie versus Civiletti ruled that this section of Title 42 implements the 13th Amendment. Well, that tells us that it's national law, because 13th Amendment is nationwide law, not municipal law. Do you see that distinction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to explain this a lot, because when people get exposed to the difference between national law and municipal law, it, it's, it's kind of weird. It's uncomfortable at first. They, they don't quite get it. But Congress can <laughs> yeah, make laws. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I was there. For, I, I, I still feel, I, you know, we have a Congress that wears two different roles, ju uh, basically legislates for two distinct bodies, but the distinctions are never really articulated in plain view. We have to rely on people like you or our own woeful inability to fumble through all the verbiage. Oh, yeah. Well, the, you know... <laughs> Let me put it this way. One of my favorite quotes is Mark Twain. And, and you know, in half-joking sense, one day he said, or wrote, the only time the children are safe is when Congress is not in session. <laughs> I mean, you got to realize these people are attorneys for the most part, and they have their own selfish uh, agenda all the time. And I don't think they have a vested interest in, in making these things clear and keeping them simple. Let's just go full circle. You know, if they had used the naturalization law right after the 13th Amendment, we wouldn't have had this invasion of the South and, and all of that subterfuge and all those machinations and, and, and all that ill will. And I think the issue would have been settled, you know, clearly. And I'm going to go even further. If, if Lincoln had done his job prior to the Civil War, maybe the Civil War could have been averted. Because the writing was on the wall. I mean, slavery was on the way out. But it took a horrible Civil War and over 600,000 casualties to settle that question. I think if he had proposed the correct constitutional amendment, history might have been different. I know that's speculation, but I, I generally don't trust lawyers. Because they they just seem to be motivated to prolong litigation and make the law more complicated than it needs to be and, and, and embed all kinds of deceptions into these laws. And I'm, I'm kind of tired of it, you know, particularly when these robes tell me I, I can do this, I can't do that, and they don't even have credentials. Who are they to tell me what I can do and can't do? If they're impersonating a federal officer, that's a felony. <laughs> I'm not the one committing a felony. You see my point? Yeah. So anyway, I'm very, very critical of the Congress now because of all these laws they've been passing ever since the Civil War. And they've made it extremely difficult for people to decide, what does the United States mean here? <laughs> if it's got three meanings, maybe the motivation on the part of the Congress is to keep the confusion going as long as possible because it you know, well, raises more money too. for attorneys. Here's <laughs> a, you know, and one of the reasons why, and I know some of my listeners were a little stumbled by me covering this subject matter, I stayed away from it because... I was involved with the Patriot Movement back in the 90s and even up until about 2000. And I watched the contortions that they went through with verbiage, with the use of different devices. The UCC was a big one. There was legitimate facts and all of that, but there was so much distortion, it became almost impossible to filter it. And we watched a whole bunch of people go to prison. Uh, we had the Montana yeah. Freeman that, that wound up using uh, uh, different UCC devices to do all kinds of things that were just patently illegal. Yeah. Um, we saw some of the great um, pioneers in the tax movement um, 
go to prison as a result of what I consider to be some very honest effort, but perhaps not executed well. So we we yeah, we we really are kind of at this place where everybody's a little tenuous about how do I go forward, what do we do, or do we just go back to sleep and stay in confusion because we can't possibly understand any of this? Well, I try to utilize the courts as much as possible, and there are an awful lot of court cases reported in the Supreme Law Library where I was directly involved as counsel. And... The frustration built to the point where I decided to shift into this full-on and non-stop investigation of missing credentials because I have the court cases to back me up. If these people don't have credentials, they're not judges, and these courts are vacant. And I mean the Supreme Court, too. I'm not stopping at the lower courts. I went all the way to the Supreme Court with my copyright case, and the Department of Justice told me three of those didn't have credentials. I have that, you know, on Department of Justice letterhead. How's that for material evidence? That wasn't my conclusion. That was their conclusion, and I've had to point out to them, you, Department of Justice, are the designated legal custodian of this credential. You're supposed to have it. When they saw the law, they said, hey, Paul, you're right. We're supposed to have it. We have it for these, we don't have it for those. There you go. So at that point I realized, why, why petition you know, a, a, a court if, if the court is legally vacant and all these people are racketeering, they don't have credentials, they're committing mail fraud. So I shifted, a lot of my emphasis shifted out of litigation into a protracted, you know, still ongoing investigation of all these missing credentials. And I... Of course, I publish all the results on the Internet because I want America to hear this. I want America to know our courts are infiltrated. We don't have remedies there. So maybe in dealing with the IRS, the proper way to handle it is to solve these issues administratively and get them to back off. And I'm happy to say we've been very, very successful in that area because, among other things, we've proven that the IRS doesn't have any authority to display Department of the Treasury on any of their pre-printed forms or any of their correspondence. So what's the first question we need to ask them? Somebody comes to me and they hire me. I have this IRS problem. What should I do? And I said, show me their correspondence. Does it say Department of the Treasury? 99.999% 99.999% of the time I can it does. tell you right up until the last 60 days it does because I just got another letter from them. And it's just, you know, it never ends. But yeah, they still put in Department of Treasury on their, on their letterhead. So you know who they are? We found out who they are. They are what was left over of the untouchables after alcohol prohibition was repealed. Because alcohol prohibition was secretly financed by the petroleum cartel, they wanted a monopoly in automotive fuel. So they secretly financed the women's Christian temperance movement to make it a big moral issue. And then when that petroleum cartel was perfected, when that you know monopoly for automotive fuels was in place, right. and alcohol was no longer being used as a fuel... Uh, oh, now it's not a big moral issue after all. We're going to repeal prohibition. That was where I stepped in. I said, what happened then? A Supreme Court case came down that said this federal alcohol administration is no longer legal inside the states of the Union, but a compromise was reached allowing them to retreat to San Juan, Puerto Rico. And that's where they are. They are doing business as DBA Trust Number 62, domiciled in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and I can show you a court case that says, yeah, they have a Secretary of the Treasury out there, too, and I can show you the regulations. I've for read Title this. 27. I've read this. This is beautiful stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you go to Title 27, look up the definitions of revenue agent, secretary, and secretary or his delegate. Right in there, it mentions Puerto Rico. Those are offices in San Juan, Puerto Rico. So there you are. It's in the Code of Federal Regulations. They're not... Department of the Treasury, the one in Washington, D.C., they are a second Department of the Treasury impersonating the de jure one. And I just put the question to them. We've done this for my clients now over two dozen times. The clients just, you know, their eyes just bug out. Wow, is it that easy? I go, well, that's the first question to ask because uh, 99% of their pre-printed forms display Department of the Treasury, and they're putting them through U.S. mail, so that's a felony. That's a mail fraud. Has anyone successfully yet prosecuted them by going to the postal inspectors 
lodging the complaints, and you've already outlined this, once you know the commission of a felony, you're responsible for reporting it, or you, I guess, by contrast, are also guilty of a felony. Is that correct? If you don't report it, yeah. That's Title 18, United States Code, Section 4. Okay, so what does a federal postal inspector do when you show him... I mean, i got a box full of these things here. I keep looking at them going, if that's true, that's cash in the box. Is anybody prosecuting the IRS for mail fraud? Uh, Not presently. Wow. I think the people at the Postal Inspection Service just want to keep their jobs. And if they rock that boat, they'll probably get fired. That's my my take because I've never seen them go after an IRS agent but let me tell you this you know we were talking about the difference between statutes at large and the US code there's an act of Congress that was signed by President Clinton called the IRS restructuring and reform act of 1998 okay it was not codified in the US code so you need to know about it number one and it did another thing that people don't generally know because they don't know about this law, it elevated the Internal Revenue Manual to the legal force and effect of law. Prior to that, it had no legal force or or effect. But it now reads, if an IRS officer or employee violates any provision in the Internal Revenue Manual, they can be terminated for that. That's very, very important. So we just hold their feet to the Internal Revenue Manual because they don't know how to do assessments. They never follow the Internal Revenue Manual. And they have to answer correspondence within 30 days. That's one of the provisions in the Internal Revenue Manual. So we go to them and we say, look, we have 30 days to produce an authority to display Department of the Treasury on this correspondence you've sent to me by U.S. Mail. And if you don't do that within 30 days, you're in default and you can be terminated because the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act authorizes termination of people like you for, for violating this provision in the Internal Revenue Manual. They freak out. These IRS people don't want to lose their jobs either. When they realize that they're looking at you know, termination and maybe a felony charge, uh, they usually retarget. That's what we found, that they're, mm-hmm. they're scared because no one has showed them this law up until now. And they thought they were U.S. Department of the Treasury, right? That's what everyone in their office says, <laughs> right? Well, wouldn't they all know? That's how bad this deception is, okay? <sighs> but anyway, back to the distinction between the U.S. Code and the statutes at okay. large. You yeah. see, the yeah. RRA 98 is a statute. It's an act of Congress, but it was never codified in Title 26. So the fact that it's not in Title 26 is highly significant. You can read all of Title 26, and you won't find this law. <laughs> I see some questions kind of percolating through the chats. There's two chat rooms. Uh, let me open it up. We're gonna, if it's okay with you, Paul, to stay on, we'll go to the bottom of the hour. Okay. And that'll give some people time if they want to call in. Um, for those of you on the chat on offplanetradio.net, the number is um, listed there. Uh, I'll give it out for anybody else, 717-910-0544 is the call-in number direct to speak with my guest, Paul Mitchell. Um, you know, I, my, my, I, was, you, you, I didn't think it was possible to get my head blown off in this interview, but you did a pretty amazing job, just some of the things that you said, and, and it's like the gravity of this is immense. Uh, in trying to understand the average person out there at this point, and I don't like talking down. Most people not only don't know about this, they really don't care. And that disturbs me more than anything, the mindset that complies with all of the garbage that's come out of this federal zone. Um, The taxes are one aspect of it. The other side of it is clearly what they've been doing since 9-11, um, last January with the enactment of the NDAA, and I watched all kinds of people freak out about that. Um, my take on the NDAA was largely that it applied to a specific type of citizen. Was I true in my assumption about that? I have to beg off there because uh, I have not looked into that law in any detail. Okay. And I, I do know that this concept, just the, the raw concept of detaining people 
without a court remedy, without habeas corpus, it's it's totally unconstitutional. But I haven't read the details. I don't know if it applies only to federal citizens or whatever. So I'm sorry, but I just I haven't been retained to provide a, a professional opinion, and I don't want to just come off the wall. No, okay? I actually appreciate you saying that as well. That that okay. that's that's fine. Um, one of the questions that I saw in the chat room had to do with signatures, and I don't know if you want to go, uh, touch on this at all. They wanted to know how they were supposed to sign their name, I guess, on documents. Do you deal with that at all? Yeah, sure. Uh, a lot of the research we did on signatures uh, uh, came out of uh, and, and resulted as a consequence of what we learned about 1040 forms. And it came out recently in the context of laws that uh, define when an assessment is valid. Because I get asked that question all the time, you know. Mm -hmm. Is this assessment valid? Is that assessment valid? You know, is this notice of federal tax lien valid? Blah, blah, blah. And there's a, a law in the Internal Revenue Code that says all of these documents have to be certified under penalty of perjury. You need to know that. And, of course... The courts have ruled that you cannot alter that perjury declaration on Form 1040, and if you do that, it renders it invalid. It's mm -hmm. no longer a valid tax return. Mm -hmm. So my point has always been, well, if, if it's true that you can't alter that perjury juror on Form 1040, what about assessments? Don't they also have to be verified under penalty of perjury? Well, that's true. They do have to be verified under penalty of perjury. But when I looked into this, this is part of the deception that you and I are hitting on, uh, I didn't find, you know, any court cases that said that in the list of court cases under that particular statute. That's Section 6065. I just happened to stumble on it one day, and you know where I found it? This was in a court case that was listed under Title 28, that's Judiciary, Section right. 1746. And that's a real sleeper, because if you read that statute and you don't know what you know now, you might miss what's going on there. But that particular statute authorizes certifications to be made under penalty of perjury in two different modes. One is within the United States, and the other is without the United States. Does that sound familiar now? Yes, yes. Within the United States means within the federal zone, and when you're uh, declaring something under penalty of perjury and you're without the United States, all you need to do is add the clarifying phrase under the laws of the United States of America. And it's very, very clear when you understand the distinction between the United States as used in that statute and the United States of America and how the one is juxtaposed against the other, you always want to invoke that statute if you're required to verify something under penalty of perjury, for example. Uh, you, you want to know about that statute and you want to know which subsection to invoke because if you invoke the wrong one, you're telling the federal government you're one of their subjects, you see? Yes. So you want, if you're outside the United States, you are then probably inside the 50 states of the Union and the 50 states are synonymous with the United States of America. So you just add parenthesis 1, close parenthesis, to the section number, and that points the reader to the proper mode of that invocation. I go into this a little bit in my book, and we elaborate on it in a whole lot more detail in a document that I filed in a lot of state and federal courts called 31 Questions and Answers about the Internal Revenue Service. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've, yeah, I've actually used this. Yes, this is a great document. Yeah, yeah that's a wonderful uh, question to put <clears throat> to people. Uh, you see, there's no requirement that you notarize a tax return. And the way Congress made that possible was to enact this statute. And all you have to do is know that there's a distinction between within the United States and without the United States. And when people understand that distinction, then they become sensitive to the fact that, well, sometimes the United States is not, you know, when the word or the phrase United States shows up in a law, it may not be what, you know, everyone thinks it is. <laughs> 
that brings us back to that triangle when we started out this uh, interview. It, it's basically the same problem, you know, and they're not being crystal clear uh, when they should be. And th in fact, they should be clear all the time because void for vagueness is a well-established doctrine in uh, federal jurisprudence, and it basically renders any law void from day one. Not from the day a court might decide that it's vague. Void for vagueness says that a law is... If it's unconstitutional due to vagueness, it was never a law. <laughs> yeah, its unconstitutionality dates from the moment of enactment, not from any decision so branding the act in question. So all this vagueness, it, it, it really ends up nullifying a lot of these laws. If they can't be understood by the guy on the street, that's the rule, by the way, the Supreme Court has given us. If the of men and women of common intelligence cannot understand a statute. That's the test. It's not what a judge thinks. It's what you know a jury thinks. It's what you and I think. If we can't understand a law, and it's written in plain English, if it's not understandable, or if the term United States has some you know special definition or limited definition or uh, an unconstitutional definition. Uh, that that type of vagueness should nullify all of these laws because they, Congress is guilty of you know committing fraud. But we have what two million lines of tax code that today is the means by which the average American is forced into compliance. Businesses rely on the the on basically. Most businesses that I've encountered rely on legal advice coming from CPAs. Yeah. And this was actually an encounter. I'll be a little transparent here. This was actually the encounter that I had with an employer six years ago who told me in no uncertain terms that he was going to enforce the levy that was placed on my salary on the advice of his accountant. And I said, well, you might want to have an attorney examine it because I handed them uh, an affidavit of 30 pages that detailed why the um, notice of levy, notice it wasn't the levy, it was the notice of levy, was not enforceable, and it turned into a huge battle, and he told me that he relied on the advice of his account, and I advised him that he might want to seek uh, you know, counsel from somebody because the CPA was simply acting out of his programming. What? Yeah. Oh, uh, that's been going on for a long time, and it's very widespread, and it's totally illegal, primarily because the Internal Revenue Manual says you can't do any collections before you've done a procedurally proper assessment. That's right in the Internal Revenue Manual in several places. The prerequisite for a lien or a levy, they both say you have to have an assessment done properly before you can even commence any kind of collections at all. And that's where we're, we're jamming them up because we proved to the IRS that they didn't do a procedurally proper assessment. They can't produce proof of a procedurally proper assessment because, you know, the bottom line, literally the bottom line where, where the assessment officer tries to sign it, it's not signed under penalty of perjury, so they're violating 6065. My experience, they're not signed at all. These are computer-generated yeah. forms that come through. There's no human being behind them. That was one of my initial complaints about this. And they Who the hell do I assessment. talk to about this? Right, and they haven't done an assessment, so they can't do any uh, collections at all. They, they can't mail a levy or serve it or, you know, even start a levy. They, they can't commence any kind of collection at all uh, unless they've done a procedurally proper assessment first. And, and that's crystal clear in the Internal Revenue Manual. They don't even know their own rules. <laughs> Is a levy or a lien not supposed to be uh, enacted under a signature of a judge? Is there not a judgment process behind the ultimate collection on these? No. They, they can collect under authority of the Internal Revenue Code if they follow the code. And for an assessment to be procedurally proper, it must be dated and signed under penalty of perjury right. by an assessment you, officer. I see what you just did there. That's beautiful. They never get that far. No, they don't. Well, they can't, furthermore, because there's no liability statute for Subtitle A. So if they even go that far, which 
is is one in a thousand of the ones I've seen, uh, then you charge them with perjury because there's no liability statute. You know, another question we ask them all the time is, why don't you list Commissioner versus Acker on your website? You know, IRS.gov. Uh-huh. You know what Commissioner versus Acker said? You can't create a tax liability with a regulation. That's a U.S. Supreme Court holding, and it's a standing case law. They don't list that authority on the in the IRS website, except in a completely different context. They don't cite that particular aspect of the decision, but it's crystal clear in there. The law does not permit a tax liability to be created solely by means of a regulation, absent the requisite act of Congress. I don't know if you know the history of me, but you know we served a subpoena on the Secretary of the Treasury to produce the Act of Congress, and not only did he fall silent in the face of that subpoena, but uh, George Bush terminated him about 60 days after that subpoena was served. That was Paul O'Neill. Right, I, I don't right. think the reason for his termination was that subpoena. It was just sort of a coincidence that we served him, and then soon after that he got fired. I think he got fired because he was a witness to all these cabinet meetings where they were planning to hit Iraq uh-huh. before 9-11. Yeah, yeah. And, and he was a witness to all these discussions, and, you know, he raised objections. He goes, why, why are we going to war with Iraq? He didn't believe there was any justification for that, so George W. Bush terminated him. But one of the consequences of that termination was that he never answered the subpoena, so he went into default. So the Department of the Treasury in Washington, D.C., that the real one, uh, they failed to answer a subpoena for the act of Congress that creates a specific liability for Subtitle A. So they're in default. The whole department's in default. <laughs> So there is no such statute at large. There is no liability statute. They did it in a regulation, but we show them the Supreme Court has said you can't do that. The law does not permit. That's what the Supreme Court said. The law does not permit this. The administrative agency just can't, you know, do it off the wall. Because why? Because only Congress can make law, and the tax liability must be, uh, you know, imposed solely by act of Congress when it comes to the federal law. Uh, and we, we, we go to the IRS and we say, look, are you aware that there's a Supreme Court case? And they look at us and they, their eyes just glaze over. Well, we didn't know that case existed. And I go, well, why don't you cite it on your website? Well, we do, but it's in a different context and it's only, you know, it's, it's only the volume and page number. It's not the parties. So they just start, you know, waffling. And we go to them, there, there is no liability. Furthermore, that regulation imposes liability on federal citizens and resident aliens. So why are you asking my client to commit perjury over here? You're telling him he has to com- com- complete Form 1040. He's not a federal citizen and he's not a resident alien. What are you doing? That's subordination of perjury. That's a separate federal felony. So they usually back off pretty fast, you know, when we get down to talking felonies. They usually just retarget. You need to know this stuff because you can pass this on. Uh, this is not unique to me. This is all right in the law, okay? If they're trying to to solicit a 1040 from somebody who's not a U.S. individual as defined, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, they need to be told, you know, to stop. If you, you gently do it. You say, look, you're practicing law without a license, so you better stop. <laughs> If they continue, then you just escalate. You say, look, you're asking, you're pressuring me to fill out Form 1040, and that's subordination of perjury, because this form is not valid unless I execute it under penalty of perjury. I can't do that because I'm not a U.S. individual. Bingo. This brings us full circle. We're, we're back to this question of municipal law again, you know, and the meaning of the United States in the Internal Revenue Code. Yeah. State is limited to District of Columbia. It's right in 7701. You know, it's definition of state and then definition of United States. That all came out of the book, The Federal Zone. So we've come full circle now because it all comes back to the meaning of the United States in that context. And what is the meaning of U.S. individual in that context? It's not hard to do if you know, if you know where to look. You take the meaning of individual. And you go down to subsection A30, and there it says, U.S. person means the following things. Citizens and residents of the United States, and then there's a long laundry list of 
juristic entities, you know, artificial juristic entities like <coughs> associations, corporations, partnerships. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. So the only living human uh, variant of a United States person as defined are federal citizens and resident aliens. That's what a U.S. individual is defined to be in the law. It's just a variant of the United States person, which is the catch-all phrase, but the components of the United States person are federal citizens and resident aliens. Those are the living, breathing human variants, and then all the others are artificial juristic entities. So this is another way we broke the code. The Conspicuous heading on Form 1040 says U.S. individual income tax return. There you are. Yeah, yeah. It's in I mean, your face. It's, see but that language right there. And you could ask what you would call a reputable professional like an accountant or even the average attorney. They're going to tell you it's an individual tax form. They don't tell you it's a tax form for an individual which is defined in a very specific way. Oh, yeah, this backed up with the uh, regulation at 26 CFR 1.1-1, where it says the liability falls on citizens of the United States and residents of the United States. There it is. It's just it's black and white. So you just need to know what small c citizen of the United States means right there in the implementing regulation. And the courts have ruled when it comes to taxes, the regulations are, uh, you know, the last word. So you go to that regulation and you say, well, yeah, th these are the people that are supposed to, evidently, in theory, are supposed to fill out Form 1040. They are U.S. individuals, right? Federal citizens and resident aliens. I really wish Congress had used the word federal citizen way back, you know, beginning in 1866. It sure would have clarified an awful lot of code covering many, many generations. I have to fault them for, you know, for allowing all this deliberate confusion and obfuscation to work its way into laws that we're supposed to obey. They're just being, you know, selfish and megalomaniacs back there. Well, and it it's feels wrong. even darker than that to me, and I don't need to go there, but I have the sense that the confusion has served their system well because they've got near universal compliance with an IRS code that probably doesn't apply to I don't know, pick a number, 80% of the people that file them every year? Oh, more than that. If there's no liability statute, then that's true of federal citizens as well. You see, they can't create that okay. liability with a regulation. Got it, got it. Yeah, I just, oh, I see what you're saying there. They haven't even created anything that requires anybody to to do this. Yeah. <sighs> And of course, you know, right after JFK was assassinated, what happened? Johnson signs the UCC into law, yeah, right? Yep. Yeah. And basically, the way the UCC is allowed to operate is that they make this presentment to you, and if you don't rebut it, then it becomes fact. In other yeah. words, they use your silence against you. Yes, yes. And that's a violation of the Fifth Amendment. That's one of the ways that Leroy Schweitzer, you know, got in trouble, quite frankly. He wasn't... Uh, totally correct as far as i'm concerned he wasn't totally correct about some of the things he was saying he was trying to sign uh confessions for other people in right. effect and you can't right. do that but he was trying to say well their silence means they they're consenting to uh or admitting a felony i said no you know leroy they have a fifth amendment right to remain silent as well you can't use their silence against them in the way you're doing it but he was so sure of himself because he had these uh, statements from credit card companies and so on. They they were setting him up. You know, they were honoring some of his documentary drafts and just setting up all his people. And then they lowered the boom on him. But the basis for you know his documentary drafts was that some you know government officer or employee had fallen silent in the face of one of his accusations and he took that to mean that they were confessing and i found that flaw in his work and he hated me for it you know <laughs> he said well his people got put me on a plane and they said you're going back to arizona and you're never coming back here i went well i'm just telling you what i know you can't use someone's silence against them in that manner okay it's just good to know that because when it comes to uh, the UCC, it has some basic fundamental flaws. We we started to go down that road in a San Jose case 
this dentist hired me, you know, and he was using Leroy Schweitzer's documentary traps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought it was in good faith because Leroy was showing people these uh, credit card statements that reflected, you know, a deduction in the debt after tendering one of these documentary drafts. Yes, I remember this. <laughs> so a lot of the students were, you know, taking that in good faith and going, well, it's working, you know, this process is working. But in the San Jose case, I wanted to go in on behalf of the United States and attack the UCC because this signature by accommodation or this conclusion that the IRS draws from your silence is uh, not correct. It, it, it violates the Fifth Amendment. You, they cannot use uh, our silence against us the way they do. You know, they send out bills, and then if you don't rebut it, then they just move to a lien, or even worse, they'll foreclose on people's homes. Yeah, it's it's pretty ugly out there. You know, I, I've been in the front lines for a long time, and I really have to fault the courts for not uh, upholding the law as written. Closing minutes here. Um, I want you to give out information about your website, what people need to know about uh, your Supreme Law Firm, um, the availability of the Federal Zone, and anything else you want to leave us with tonight, Paul? Oh, okay. Well, after the book got modified and then hosted on the Internet without my permission, it really saturated the market for the book, and the sales went to zero. And all of those defendants have not paid me a dime for all that litigation, but I'm, I'm still after them, and I may actually get some money out of AOL because I filed a, what's called a, a UCC financing statement against them. So mm -hmm. they've got that mm -hmm. to deal with now. But the book is free if you don't mind accessing an electronic copy. And that's available on a link from the homepage of supremelaw.org. That's the Supreme Law Library. And it's also a link to 31 questions and answers. Because I've gotten a lot of very, very positive feedback from people all around the country to the, you know, the comprehensive and in-depth nature of 31 questions and answers. And the beauty of accessing the Internet copy is that it has hyperlinks to all the supporting uh, evidence and court cases and regulations. I mean, for example, when I say there's a regulation that mentions Puerto Rico in the definition of revenue agent, you know, there's a link right to that regulation. Mm -hmm. You don't have to go to the law library. You just click on it and bang, there it is. You can read it yourself. And the case that I'm talking about, Commissioner versus Acker, you know, where they say uh, the law does not permit uh, a tax liability to arise from a regulation absent an act of Congress, you know, the link to that decision is right in there, so you can click on that. The court case comes right up, bingo. I mean, the Internet's been a boon to educating people into these uh, complexities. And then if you want to see, for example, the, the court cases where we actually filed that without any rebuttals from any opposing parties, there's a list of those court cases as well, and also a list of the court cases where the federal zone has been entered into evidence, like my copyright case. But we've used it in other cases as well as evidence. And uh, I think what I should also mention is that if, if people uh, listening now would like to ask me a question or two, uh, I'm happy to answer one or two questions, but please don't feel like uh, you know I'm supposed to be everyone's free counsel, uh, particularly if I get a lot of questions. But one of the reasons why we have the law library is to use it as a vehicle to teach people who want to pay $10 a month to... Uh, get our assistance in, you know, exploring the library, asking questions. So we have a discussion list called Supreme Law. Yes, I was going to ask about that. And the only thing is we ask you to pay through the end of the calendar year so that I don't have a lot of red tape and keeping track of, you know, starts and stops to subscriptions. So you have to pay $10 a month through the rest of the calendar year. And that gives you the right to receive all messages that are posted to that list server. And it also gives you access to a very, very large uh, message archive that has something like 10,000 messages now, you know, where, where you can browse and search. And a lot of these questions have already come up numerous times from, you know, a variety of different people, clients. Uh, when I find something, you know, I'll just... I'm the biggest poster because I'm, I'm constantly doing research and I'm, you know, I'm constantly reviewing the news and court cases. People will write to me and say, this court just did this. Do you have his credentials? And, you know, and I just tell people where to look. If we've got the credential results, 
you know, we've already posted it. So I really, you know, encourage people to take advantage of the Supreme Law discussion list as well. You've got to know that you don't have access to that message archive unless you pay the subscription. So the Supreme Law Library, what you see when you peruse the tables of contents is only like the top 10 or 15 percent of the whole library. There's a, there's an under, a lower floor, if you will. I got <laughs> a caller in here. Let me, let me bring this caller in. Hello, there's caller. There's a lot more to it that you will see if you subscribe to our discussion list because I can show you, you know, how to get access to the things that don't show up to people that are just, you know, browsing it for free. Yeah. Hello? Yeah, we're still here. Okay. Sorry. I had a caller trying to get in, but uh, I don't know if the call dropped or what. Yeah. Um, are you there? Hi, yes, caller. Sir. I uh, I noticed that Paul put L. Barcroft's book on the in the Supreme Law Library not long ago, and I was wondering if Paul had a comment on the FSIA, the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act. Did you hear that, Paul? Yeah, I haven't read the act, and you need to be careful because there are acts of Congress that use the word foreign in a municipal context, and in a municipal context, the states of the Union are foreign with respect to the District of Columbia. So a, a, a sovereign who may be a state citizen, say, out in one of the states of the Union, may be considered... Uh, you know, a sovereign in the sense of that word as defined for purposes of that statute. But uh, I just, I just haven't read it. Okay, and you, you've got to be really careful because sometimes Congress is is wearing this other hat and it's enacting municipal law. And in the context of laws like that, state citizens that inhabit the states of the union are foreign. They they are outside that jurisdiction. Okay, so Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act, it might be, and I'm, I'm saying this because I haven't read it, and I haven't, you know, been asked to evaluate it and review it and look at the court cases that have uh, been decided under it, but it, it, it may actually apply to state citizens who are outside federal municipal jurisdiction. Uh, I'll give you a really classic example that's in the context of this post-Civil War era, just before the Secretary of State declared the 14th Amendment ratified, the Congress enacted a real sleeper law called the expatriation law. Have you heard about this? I have not. Okay. Um, the whole story is written up by a, a woman who has passed away. Her name is Linda Lyon. And she's in the author's subsection. So at supremelaw.org forward slash, go to authors, go to forward slash L-Y-O-N. That's the last name of this author. And she's written an incredible piece. I think it's entitled, The Day Our Country Was Lost Without Firing a Shot, something like that. And she goes through this whole era right after the Civil War ended, leading up to the Reconstruction Acts and going through Johnson's veto and all that stuff. And she found this little gem that's called the Expatriation Act, and Congress has recognized the uh, authority and the right of uh, citizens to basically expatriate. Now, some people read that, and they think it means to, uh, you know, move to another country and expatriate from, you know, any association with America. But after I read Linda Lyons' analysis of this act, I realized, oh, yeah, she's, she makes a very persuasive case that that was the back door for anybody that did not want to get sucked into this 14th Amendment status. And, of course, Congress wrote it in such a way that uh, people could be easily misled about to whom it applied. But she convinced me that it was a back door for anybody that didn't want to get sucked into this uh, this new legislative democracy that was the real intent of this you know Fourteenth Amendment brouhaha. So look that up. Uh, I think I have links to the actual statutes at large, 
And if not, you can, you know, you can find it uh, in any law library. I can't remember if I actually scanned that law. It's not very long. I think it spans like maybe two pages at most. But it's it's in this same context that uh, the states are foreign with respect to the municipal jurisdiction of the federal government. So state citizens are legally foreign with respect to D.C., just like a uh, corporation that's chartered by Congress is likewise foreign to, with respect to any of the states. It's a hard transition for a lot of people to make, but the Expatriation Act can be applied to people that, just don't want to be part of this 14th Amendment crowd. It's right in there in the law, and the fact that it was enacted like just days before the 14th Amendment was declared ratified, I mean, that has to be more than coincidence. So I hope that helps you, but as far as the law in question, I haven't really done any serious work on it, so I'm going to have to beg off. Okay, so so it sounds like that, that uh, Al's analysis is similar to Miss Lyons in that the foreign aspect is outside of the federal zone correct so 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 it sounds like it it, it lines up with what with what everything you've been saying if foreign means yeah uh outside the municipal jurisdiction of the federal government and we know what that is now geographically speaking it's the district of columbia guam virgin islands american samoa puerto rico and all of these federal enclaves that have been ceded to the Congress by a state legislature, like military bases, okay, these are all scattered little islands of, you know, geography. But when you combine them together, they are the area where Congress is city hall. They are the area that, that enjoys exclusive federal jurisdiction. And the authority comes out of the U.S. Constitution in two places. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 17. That's the, you know, enclave clause, if you will, and then there's the territory clause at Article 4, Section 3, Clause 2. And when you take those two authorities and you combine them, the areas that fall into one or the other, uh, taken together, are the area where Congress is, the municipal jurisdiction, where, where, where Congress has exclusive legislative authority. There's no state governor, there's no state legislatures, okay, and there's no state courts. Congress does all the lawmaking for that area. Now you contrast that with the states where, you know, they are stars on the flag, they have their own governors, they have their own state legislatures, they have their own state courts. All of those laws are foreign with respect to D.C. just as D.C.'s laws are all foreign with respect to us. So uh, in, in that sense, yeah, D.C. is foreign with respect to California, and California is foreign with respect to D.C. It, it, you know, it's mutual in that respect. So the, the concept of foreign and domestic is kind of a floating relative concept. Just like I stress that distinction between foreign and domestic So essentially the definition is contextual. You have to be able to, to read exactly to whom it applies. Right. And a, a place to look uh, uh, to determine whether it is national or municipal is to see if Congress has played games with the definition of state. Exactly. Now, for example, if you want to see a real classic instance of a federal municipal definition of state, even though Congress is not supposed to do this, they've been doing it a lot for a long time, look at Internal Revenue Code, Title 26, Section 3121E. You should write that down. If this is a classic one, you know, and we have confirmation from experts inside the federal government, it defines state to include only D.C., Guam, Virgin Islands, American Samoa, and Puerto Rico. You see, there's a rule of statutory construction here. Let me give you an example. If, if Congress defi defines the word car to include Pontiacs, Chevrolets, and Oldsmobiles, well, then a Cadillac's not a car for purposes of that law. And the rule is a Latin rule, inclusio unius est exclusio alterius. Any term that's omitted must be inferred as an intentional act of Congress. So if Congress doesn't mention the 50 states, or if Congress doesn't mention California or Alabama or Florida, 
the omission of those places must be inferred as an intentional act of Congress. This is a rule of statutory construction. And that's why the definition of state at 3121E in the Internal Revenue Code is so pregnant with meaning because it doesn't mention the 50 states. It doesn't mention the several states. It's restricted to those limited areas that are not states. And you've got to know that. You've got to know that this is not an all-inclusive sort of meaning of state. It's a very restrictive meaning of state. So they're talking about a different kind of state. Another thing that Congress did, and, and I'm really pissed off about this, they hijacked capital S state. That's their municipal you know, subdivision now. And when they want to refer to a state of the union, they change the S to small s. Well, that violates the Eisner prohibition. The Supreme Court has said you can't modify the Constitution by an act of Congress. The Congress is constantly redefining state and United States, so they hijacked the term that's in the Constitution. The term that's in the Constitution is capital S state. That's a state of the union, a star in the flag. But in federal law, it means something else. <laughs> and when Congress wants to refer to a state of the union, a star in the flag, they use a small s in state. I mean, it's it's really subversive, you know. Uh, you know, I have to agree with Randy. I I, I think it's dark and malevolent, but uh, you know, I, I have to stay close to the facts and the right, law. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And that's your role in that. Um, did we answer your questions, caller? Did you have anything else you want oh, to follow? No, it was beautiful, beautiful. And one one just one other addition is is this Buck Act. Don't the the the, the territories and the enclaves? Isn't there the some overlay that also adds into that because in Title Four or Five of USC, don't they also redefine state there? Um, oh yeah, <laughs> it gets worse because <laughs> you know these <laughs> political subdivisions that have uh, overlaid the de jure states of the union, the guys that have underwritten the federal debt and so on, and they're collecting money for ostensibly for that purpose. Okay, they, they're doing the same thing in their law. I had a client hire me to examine the uh, tax law in California. Yeah, it, it does the same thing. This is a they franchise tax state. board, the franchise board? Franchise tax yeah. board, yeah. 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 Uh, th that's uh, in letters, let's see, supremelaw.org forward slash letters forward slash FTB. That stands for Franchise Tax Board dot HTM. Yeah, take a look at that document. Man, that'll blow you out because it proves that California isn't even mentioned in the definition of state. <laughs> so they're not even talking about California in a California law. It's so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the Buck Act was another uh, another one of these uh, redefinitions. Uh, Richard McDonald did a pretty good analysis of that. Uh, do you know how to limit your search in Google to a particular domain? Oh, you know, if you want to look up... I do. Occur okay, great. So just limit the search to supremelaw.org and search for Buck Act. And I, I know there's stuff out there. You know, we, we've been at this since 1990, so I, I don't have... Uh, photographic memory of all the library's contents, but that's why we put it on the Internet, so you could search it with Google and Bing. So I think Richard McDonald's article on the Buck Act is still out there. Okay, Paul, thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, caller. It was, <clears throat> uh, wow. <laughs> we could probably go four or five hours, but I know that, uh, well, it's your evening. It's my coming up on early morning and uh, I really appreciate deeply you coming on the show Paul and being so generous with your expertise and all the information um, there's a couple places on the uh, file the audio file where I just bookmarked it because I want to go back uh, anybody that's stuck with us through the show tonight you'll be able to download the files from wolfspiritradio.com if you go onto the website um I believe Dave will have that up in pretty timely order. It may take me a couple of days to post it to the website at offplanetradio.com, and we'll try and let everybody know the show's up. But you need to listen to this from beginning to end and grasp that we really did close a lot of loops on a very complex subject tonight. And there's a ton of information in that that can begin to launch you into understanding the things we talked about. Complex stuff 
made very simple by our guest, Paul Mitchell, tonight. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to wrap this up. Uh, next week, Dean Clifford will be here from Canada, I hope. Dean has a nasty habit of uh, getting locked up from time to time, and I haven't heard back from him. So I'm trusting that he's free right now and not incarcerated, but he'll be with us to talk about the sovereign citizen movement and some of the things that go into that. Paul Mitchell, thanks for coming on. And uh, somebody's telling me I have a call coming in. Sorry, we're closing down the show tonight, guys. Um, you can follow up with emails as well with me at offplanetradio.com, and I'll be happy to forward any information or questions you have on to Paul. So that's going to close it out for tonight. I'm Randy Moggins. This is Off Planet Radio. The truth is out there. It's inside you. Keep looking for it.